All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm assuming you can hear me. My name is Ben Shapiro with RMI, formerly the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, our host, Joe Boris, is, is joining us, was here a moment ago, but uh, is having some internet issues. So hopefully we'll have him back in just a moment. Uh, but I thought that we'd just get started and the three of us panelists can introduce ourselves. So again, Ben Shapiro with RMI, happy to be here and talking about EV incentives and how to best charge your, your vehicle at home and elsewhere. Um, a little bit about RMI, we're a research organization focused on climate and clean energy. I specifically focus on electric vehicles and transportation electrification more broadly, uh, both on the policy side and thinking about how we really build out the infrastructure that we need to support this transition to a clean energy and clean transportation future. So maybe I'll pass it to Tom next to introduce himself, if you don't mind. Yeah, hey, thanks, Ben. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Tom Bowen. I'm the president of Cumerit Solutions. Um, Cumerit is focused on electrification, starting with transportation electrification for both residential and commercial, commercial customers. Um, we leverage a technology platform combined with a contractor network that's unparalleled in the, unparalleled in the industry. Um, to date, we've installed over 200,000 level two chargers. Um, and our focus is really driving electrification through the vehicle and then broadly through the home and the commercial facility. So we I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Looking forward to some of the questions as well. Julian? Yes, perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um, again, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm thankful for this opportunity to be here for this webinar. So my name is Julian. Uh, I'm with Flow uh, and I'm an application engineer. So basically, Flow, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're an EV charging equipment manufacturer and network provider. Uh, who is active mainly in North America. Um, and basically, we're also trying to drive EV adoption through offering the, the best EV charging experience for you, for the new drivers and the existing ones uh, throughout solutions at homes or, or in public settings. Uh, and I'm sure we'll go more into the details uh, as uh, Joe uh, join us back. Joe, are you with us? Uh, yeah, finally. I, I was in the, uh, the pre-meeting and then got wiped out for some reason. But uh, yeah, I'm glad we're all here. Looks like we're, we've got this thing underway. So uh, have we done formal introductions yet or we're starting from right now? We are introduced. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, you know, one of the things that we talked about when we were getting ready to introduce this, uh, this webinar and we were kind of planning for it is who it was for, why we were here. And I think the reality is that a lot of people are starting to buy electric vehicles. They've got their electric vehicle on order. They're getting these things in. I saw recently, it looks like there was, uh, we've reached that 5% tipping point for EV adoption. So now it's going to be kind of taking off from here. And, you know, this webinar is really to answer some of those basic questions that people who might have not been looking at an EV six months ago, whether it's because of their, you know, gas prices, or maybe their neighbor has one, they're looking at it, and they're, they're kind of asking the question, how am I going to charge my EV? Not, not kind of a generic, how do you charge an EV, but how is this going to fit into my life? How am I going to make it work? And how's that going to go? And then obviously, we have you know, Ben Shapiro, not that Ben Shapiro uh, from RMI. We have Tom from Q Merit, and uh, we have Julian Blancher here from, from Flow. So uh, thanks everybody for bearing with me while I deal with my technical difficulties. Um, you know, and, and I kind of want to start with sort of a broad question. Um, you know, when, when we start getting into charging, there are some of those engineering terms, some of those electrical terms that people don't really understand. Uh, I, you know, I want to talk about 110 and 220 charging. What does that really mean? Level one, level two, um, kind of what does that mean and, and how are those important? And uh, I'd like to direct that to Julian. Yeah, so I think we, we kind of tried to touch base already a bit on, on this topic and, and Tom was uh, about to, to complete what I, I was just describing earlier. Um, so I think we covered some of the grounds when, when it comes to level one versus level two. Um, I was just wondering if uh, either Ben or Tom had uh, more to say, but uh, that where, was where we, we stopped when you, when you joined, uh, Joe. Yeah, and, and Julian, I think most consumers are always interested in how long will it take, and particularly if they're looking at scheduling charging outside of their residence. And so I, I think you covered it pretty well with the standard level one charging, and it'll just vary depending on the vehicle but uh, most customers can expect to get some range overnight with a level one charger of between maybe 15 and 25 miles of, a, of range on that vehicle um, for that charge. 
Some circumstances that works great for customers if they don't have as extensive commute, if they can control that and they can schedule that weekend charge. Uh, more often than not, we see our customers are, are leaning towards level two charging when they're focused on residential. Level two charging will allow, under most circumstances, uh, a full charge overnight for that vehicle. So customers um, are able or drivers are able to count on a full charge as, um, as they go through. The, the availability of public charging will vary, but level three charging can usually, you'll see them outside of retail locations, um, coffee shops, et cetera, where a customer might expect to be there within that 30 minute window. And as long as that charger is up and available and functional, they would be able to get some degree of charge in that 25 to 30 minute period of time. Well, I, I want to kind of speak to the fact that, you know, a lot of people who don't have an EV now, they're, they're not, they're still thinking in that kind of old mindset of I'm going to be in my house and then I'm going to go somewhere and get fuel, whether it's electric fuel or whether it's gasoline. And because 80%, if not more of these of EV owners are getting their primary charging at the house, I kind of want to focus on that. When we talk about 110 and 220, this is power that's already in most homes, right? So like that's like the dryer outlet, the utility outlet, and then a 110 is just like a standard outlet, right? Correct. And so it does give, uh, in most cases, the ability with a level one charger that would come with the vehicle to be able to function at some level of charge. Um, what we see is, is most commonly now, Joe, is that as, as drivers would look to upgrade, there, there always is the uh, issue of capacity in the home, and they have to consider that. The most common analogy we use um, as it relates to driving, you mentioned there's always fuel to go get when you're in your car. Um, most EV drivers will view their vehicles more like they would view their smartphones, is the smartphone tends to be plugged in at their desk um, or their nightstand overnight. They charge it, might even be their alarm clock, right? And, and, uh, and they can count on a full day's charge. And so during t periods where you'd be using your phone a lot, you're almost looking for that emergency, whether it's the airport or something like that, to the ability to charge. And so the convenience of having overnight charge, we see about 20 to 25% of, of installs for level two charging will require some degree of a panel upgrade um, to, to provide additional capacity. Um, most of the panels that the, the residents will have in the U.S. right now are uh, less than 200 amp, probably 60% of those would be less than 200 amp. And so um, when you start to see vehicles like the trucks coming that, that provide different functionality, even bi-directional, those type of um, panel upgrades will be required. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, so I, I, we're talking about the panel upgrades, we're talking about the different kind of infrastructure back end stuff. But as far as the charger itself, you know, like different companies make different wall chargers, you know, in garage chargers flow, obviously, uh, you know, the one of the sponsors of this, of this webinar produces a number of these. As someone who may not be familiar with some of the different advantages, pros and cons of having a dedicated wall charger, a dedicated in-home charger, what are some of the reasons that someone would go for that? Because I mean, based on what we're talking about here with that 110 and the 220, if I have an electrician come out and upgrade my panel, why can't I just plug into the wall? Why is it preferable to have a, uh, you know, a dedicated charger? I'll, I'll leave that to Julian. Yeah, sure. Uh, and that's a very good question, Joel. I think uh, as Tom alluded to, uh, there's a few questions that uh, future AV drivers may ask himself and try to answer. So basically, uh, what type of vehicles are they looking at? Um, as uh, Tom mentioned, those vehicles are getting bigger and bigger. Their onboard chargers may be able to get more and more power and their batteries as well may need more and more energy to be replenished. Um, but on the other end, they may also look at what's their daily commute, what are their activities, how many kilometers they may do uh, during the day. And if they are looking at overnight charging, then the calculation that they can make a bit in their head is whether or not for eight hours of a time, they can replenish their batteries with the charging solution they will select. Um, obviously, those level two chargers, they offer uh, this, uh, let's say, peace of mind when it comes to charging because you can go a little bit faster and you may be a little bit more flexible. Um, the other aspects that I would uh, highlight is obviously when you look at different type of installation, different type of um, residences, 
uh, there's a lot of differences from one to another. So you need to be able to adjust depending on where you're going to park your car and how you want to install your charging station. So having a dedicated level two may offer you uh, the flexibility to install wherever it suits you best. Uh, and as well as uh, those uh, pros, let's say, of having those cable managed, those cables at the right locations for you to reach your car ports. Um, and all in all, just having a, a nice elegant solution that will offer you a reliable charging. So um, as Tom mentioned as well, uh, we want the drivers to come back to their own, be able to plug and not necessarily think about whether or not it will work. So having a, a sturdy uh, and, and reliable solution is really what to look for in a charging station. Well, Julian and Tom, I'm, I'm trying to lead you guys into an answer. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just kind of stop being shy about it and get to it. Um, there is a safety concern that a lot of new EV drivers or neighbors of new EV drivers have you know, often asked. They talk about, you know, how about electrical fire safety? How about installation safety and things like that? And some cars, if you have a residential, you know, residential circuit that's on a 30 amp, you know, a Tesla is very good. You can go into the settings and set it to draw at 24, give yourself that 20% buffer. But a lot of the systems that are out there, you know, Ford Mach-E is a great example. You plug it in, it's going to try to pull all those 30 amps. With a dedicated charger or a dedicated charging system that's a little bit smarter, has some of those safety features built in, you're not going to have an overheating cord. You're not going to be tripping breakers. Everything's going to be certified and rated safe for your application. And then finally, you're just not going to trip over the thing. You know, Julian spoke to cable management. When you trip over one of these cables, not only is it a heavy cable, but it can pull down depending on where the outlet is. It can pull down a pretty heavy charging box on top of yourself. And, you know, whenever you have a high power circuit, just yanking it out of the wall it, it is problematic, right? I mean, Tom, you're, you're probably the most electrician of the, of the electrical engineering people on here. I think you can speak to some of that. Yeah, obviously the cable management and the functionality in the garages can be a challenge and, and design and, and products like Flow um, are really designed around <clears throat> making those products as easy for their customers to use. Um, the other piece back to safety though, Joe, is, is obviously always you should ensure that your installation is done properly, properly permitted and evaluated by a licensed engine, engine or an electrical um, technician as they're doing that level of install. Installed properly, these are, are very safe. Um, the problems with electrical vehicles pale in comparison to the traditional ice engines, issues that have been seen over time. Um, and with the proper installation, again, there's really no concerns. Um, the discussion around draw, and I think you'll get to that a little bit, some of the questions I'm seeing, the questions in terms of time of use and when you use your power and load constraints of the utility, are all considerations that these smart chargers are factoring in into those discussions and consumers should think about um, how they use their charger, time that they use their charger. Um, but again, we would say with the proper installation, these are very safe devices. Yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, the data bears that out and we'll, we'll put some of that into the notes here. Now, I, as you did mention, Tom, there are some people asking questions about the grid. If everybody plugs into the wall at the same time, is this something that, you know, is, is there going to be electricity for my car when I plug into the wall? And Ben, I know that, you know, we can speak a little bit more about the grid in and of itself. And, and you know, you're, that's kind of one of the, your levels of expertise. But in addition to, you know, having that confidence within the electrical supply, right, there's other things that we're doing from a policy level, from a national level to kind of improve the quality and improve the guarantee of that availability and there's other things that we can do locally within our municipalities and with our utility companies to try to make those things better. Can you speak to that a little bit, Ben? Yeah, thanks, Joe. I'm happy to. I would say that from the individual consumer perspective, you either have recently bought or are thinking about buying an EV, you shouldn't really be concerned about being able to get the, the necessary electricity to power your car either today or in the future. Um, that is something that your utility, your local utility, their regulator, if they're a private company, uh, state government and so forth, are, are very actively planning around. But it's not to say that that's a, a given from a broader societal perspective. And there's a lot that we need to be doing to put in place the necessary infrastructure to procure energy and ideally renewable energy to power these vehicles 
So I think that from the individual perspective, um, that will all be figured out, which is not to make light of it, but I don't think there should be a concern from the EV driver perspective. With that said, I think there are things that we can all do to support more of a transition to this being a fundamental part of our transportation system, um, such as encouraging local leaders to put in place EV ready building codes so that when you build a new apartment complex or something like that, you put in place the wiring as part of the construction to save costs so that you can hook up EV chargers much more easily at lower overall cost um, than if you were to retrofit that building down the line. Things like that, uh, potentially advocating at the, at the state level to put in place policies that support not only incentives to purchase EVs, but also incentives to uh, secure the infrastructure or the chargers for individuals, for workplaces and so forth. So. Lots of work to be done there, but I think that by simply joining this community and, and driving an EV today, you're really uh, taking the first important step towards that. And are there organizations, I know you're with Rocky Mountain Institute, are there organizations, whether it's like yours or, or yours, that you know people can subscribe to, can kind of follow along with, so that they can see these opportunities locally to be able to, you know, try to influence change and try to make that change happen more quickly and more sustainably. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, thanks for the, the opportunity for a shameless plug for RMI. Uh, you know, we are, I think we, most of our we work- We are nothing if not shameless here. <laughs> uh, most of our work is a little bit more on sort of the research side of things, right? What needs to be done to really lay out the roadmap to, to reach these clean transportation goals that we have and to build the infrastructure to support that system. We don't do a, a whole lot of direct advocacy, um, but we do have a lot of great information, including things like, you know, the topics we're discussing today and, you know, what might make most sense for me as an EV driver, what can I do to support this? Um, there are a handful of other organizations. I, I don't think I'll go through a list at the moment, but i um, happy to follow up with some that, you know, depending on the topic people are interested in can certainly help to both provide information and provide opportunities to support the policies and the incentives that I think are really going to be critical to push this forward more quickly. Yeah. Now I, I just want to kind of stop here. You know, when we were going through this and I, I wouldn't call it a rehearsal it's a little less formal than that, but when we were going through all this, Ben had this really great line and he said, there's plenty of reasons. Let me, let me see. I wrote it down because it was so good. There's no reason to feel bad about driving an EV and there's lots of reasons to feel good about it. And through your work at RMI, you're doing the research, you're doing those things. You know, one of the things that critics of EVs will often say is, well, you're just moving the emissions from your tailpipe to a coal plant, but that's not really what's happening, right? No, that's, a, I think, a misconception, perhaps verging on uh, sort of baiting from, from EV uh, detractors, shall we say. I think that in most parts of the world, and I would even venture to say today, it might be almost all of the world, the electric power mix is sufficiently clean. And that's not to say that it's very clean, but it doesn't have to be that clean for EVs to be a, a more, uh, from a carbon perspective, environmentally sustainable choice than internal combustion engines. There, there is a, a lot of good and compelling research here that shows even in a place like China, for example, where the electric power mix is considerably more coal intensive than what we have in pretty much any part of the US, um, there are still very significant net benefits from a carbon perspective from driving an EV relative to an internal combustion engine vehicle, a traditional, traditional gasoline yeah. car that is. Okay. So, so let's just say, let's kind of take the next step. Let's say we're convinced, right? You've answered all our questions. We're confident in the supply of electricity going to be there. You know, we're, we have done the research. We've gone to your company's website. We've looked at everything. We go, wow, this is great. This is what I want to do. I want to be more sustainable. I want to kind of kick this back to Julian. You know, there are smart features that are worked into some of these chargers that are out there that will enable you to kind of be on off peak hours when that sustainable energy is more readily available. And there's some cost saving stuff there as well, right? Like your smart chargers can help figure out when the least expensive time to charge is. Is that correct? Sure. Uh, thanks, Joe, for the, for the question. So uh, I think it's important to, to maybe uh, make a difference between different type of level two charging stations. So there are the smart charging station, the network charging station. So those are that are charging stations that are connected. Uh, and those are, they are also what we refer to as dumb charters or just, uh, let's say, a simplified charging less, stations. Less that, that smart. Simply... <laughs> that would simply provide you with the power output when you plug it, right? And that's all it does, but it does it very well. So there's those two options, right? 
Uh, so with the network capabilities of a connected charger, as you write, uh, there are a lot of advantages that can be leveraged for the EV drivers. Um, as Ben mentioned, uh, there's a lot of utilities out there that are making great progress and that are building programs or incentives uh, towards EV charging. So that would be, I think, a first step for an EV driver to maybe uh, try to search about its area and whether or not there's some of those incentives to buy a, a connected chargers or some uh, rates to preferably charge at certain period of the day. Um, and with those connected charging stations, that's exactly what it will be able to do. Um, so a few of those features could be to have some charging schedule, so charge for certain periods of the day, limit the power output if you uh, have certain peaks for uh, your residents. Um, or just uh, even one step further, participate in some uh, demand response program with those utilities that may have uh, those in place. So uh, there's a lot of um, benefits to having a, a, a connected charging stations. Now, I, I just want to touch on that demand response thing. For anybody who's listening to that who is not 100% familiar with what demand response means, Julian, can you give us a 10-second lesson on that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and maybe Ben, I'll, I'll let you complete it if you have more to say. Uh, but I would say that the demand response as a whole is, is a way that utilities are trying to influence all the loads uh, they have on their grid and trying to control them to a certain extent. Uh, and it can really vary in, in, in forms. It can be very advanced, very complicated, where they would ask certain peoples to charge expressively for an event, a certain period uh, of time or it could be more passive where they would just simply say to all EV drivers in their area, well, we're gonna incentivize charting between those times of the days. Um, so that's really the, the quick, uh, let's say, overview of demand response, but I'm sure, uh, Ben, if you have more to say, uh, I'll let you. Yeah, no, I think that that's all right, Julian, and, and well said. All that I would add would be, whether we're talking about demand response or more broadly managed charging and moving around when the charging takes place, I think the way to think about this is that it doesn't always cost the utility the same amount of money to provide you the same unit of energy. That varies throughout the day, and that varies based on if, if everybody wants the same, wants their energy at the same time, everyone comes home from work and plugs and turns on their electric oven and all these things, that quickly gets to be expensive for the utility. So this whole slew of programs, again, demand response and other types of managed charging, time of use rates, all of that is intended to, to communicate a price signal to individual consumers that if you move around when you need that electricity, whether it's for your car or whether it's for other appliances, there's value to that. And sometimes that value comes through the form of just lower electricity rates. So that's what we call a time of use rate. Um, but sometimes there are more active programs where the utility will give you credits for reducing your demand or um, other more advanced forms of these programs. So the whole point is just sort of communicating price signals to align with what the costs are on the utility side. Right. And, and it's then, an extremely valuable tool or set of tools, I would say, that we're going to need to lean into more as we go forward. So as a consumer, that sounds like it would be a lot to figure out. But if I have a smart charger, I don't have to worry about it. I plug it in and that thing figures it out, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll let my colleagues here uh, speak more to that because they're closer to it. But exactly, it's not something you don't want to be, uh, you know, setting your, your iPhone with the reminders four times a day. And, okay, go, go outside and plug the car in and then now, now go an hour later and unplug it. You know, they're not usually quite that, uh, usually longer periods of time. But you want to have that be automated if possible. It's not, it's not that realistic for most people to, to juggle that sort of uh, thing. So, yeah, anyways, I'll pass it. Maybe Tom wants to speak to that. Yeah. I think the only point uh, that I would add, and, and a lot of great feedback in here, and as a consumer, you want to be as informed as you can when you, you look to purchase that vehicle. Um, and so there is usually a lot of good information through your utility. Most of the time we see customers are dissatisfied because they hadn't done the investigation ahead of time. And so they may see an increase in their utility costs, um, different constraints. And so most of the utilities that we partner with have great educational tools on their websites now that will inform customers about special rates um, that they may have available. Some utilities are during certain hours of the, day, of the evening aren't even charging for that, uh, the, the charging the vehicle because they're trying to drive to those times when units of energy are of lower cost as, as Ben said. Some are as simple as incentives to offset the cost of the charger. So you should always investigate through utility because they may be adding an incentive just to offset the charge of the cost of the charger or the installation costs. 
we've seen some utilities are bundling those incentives with that panel upgrade. And so you can actually, if you have to incur the cost or want to incur the cost to provide more capacity for your home for broader electrification, the utilities may incentivize that panel upgrade as well and give you the opportunity to opt into a program like Julian described as, as a demand response program where they may simply say that, that during the hours of four to eight or some other peak demand period, they have the ability to limit that charge. But then in a level two charger, as long as you're going again by nine, 10 o'clock that evening, then you'll have a full charge um, through the course. So it, it turns out to be good for the utility and good for the, the driver as well. Now, Tom, you touched on something there that I, I, I know we're going to get to later because we all have the same outline, right? But I know that, you know, I want to kind of bring this up now because we're on the topic and it's a top of mind for everybody. You mentioned that the utility company might incentivize kind of upgrading some of those upgrades. Can you speak a little bit towards what some of the incentive programs are with different utility companies? Like I know PGE up in the Pacific Northwest, they're doing uh, $500 for an installation of a home charger. ComEd in some markets is doing, you know, $500 towards the installation. General Motors and some of their uh, dealerships, they're doing the home charge, not the installation, but they're kind of including the home charger in the purchase of the Chevy Bolt. Can you speak to how some of those incentives work and how we might be able to find out in our areas whether we as consumers qualify for those? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And so first you hit Joe is in some cases to always ask the question at the point of purchase if there is any additional incentives that the car manufacturer is providing because they may be providing something to incentivize that consumer for there. The utility is a great. And when you say at the time of purchase, you mean at the dealership or at right. the, on the, at the manufacturer, if you're doing it through the website. Correct. We've, we partner with uh, OEMs that have offered incentives off the charger right out of the purchase. So the, the uh, consumer immediately gets a rebate through the incentive or through the OEM of the vehicle. But in many cases, those utilities, because they're planning for those grid events, as we've discussed earlier, and then, and, and making sure as, as Ben pointed out, they're thinking through grid management and load management. So they're providing incentives as well. And some could be as simple as, you know, 250 or $500 off the cost of the charger. Um, and, and those are, you can sign up at the point of, of purchase and the utility will incentivize. Some are offsetting the cost of the installs. And these are residential and commercial as well. There's some very, very aggressive programs now for commercial charging. So if you own a multifamily facility, for instance, in a number of utilities, the, in the or in the number of the utility geographies, they will incentivize the infrastructure as well as the charging network. So the key message here is the utilities in this particular cases are providing good information. Um, managed charging was mentioned before. And so you can opt into a managed charging program with many of the utilities and and receive incentives to offset your costs. And so the key here is ask the questions. Um, the utilities have good information and all of this makes the economics of driving an EV vehicle. We've talked, yeah, everyone talks about the performance and, and if you've driven one, you know, it's, it's pretty special, uh, but the economics as well. Um, you see the co cost of gas right now. So it's easy to do the math. And if you can get those installation costs down, Joe, it, it really helps. Now, I, I have two things that I want to bring up. So we're talking about incentives. Some of those are in the forms of rebates that you get as a, as a credit later. Some of those are instant, like an instant cash reduction. Um, but there's another incentive that's out there that, you know, a number of businesses and even home customers can take advantage of. And that's called on-bill financing. Can you Talk to us a little bit about on-bill financing and how we might be able to find out if we qualify for that. Yeah, I can speak just briefly to that. On-bill financing is a strategy that the utilities will use. And I think of it just in the terms of financing, um, if you use your credit card or another financing vehicle, where in this particular case, the utility is providing that installation or that cost up front. And then you're just spreading that payment across on the bill. So um, you can see the, receive the benefits of the charger or even some of the other upgrades, the panel upgrade up front, um, and, and then pay for that over time right on your bill. And so particularly if you're seeing the advantages of reduced cost associated with 
fuel if you're seeing your cost come down because you're driving in an EV as opposed to a ICE vehicle and paying the cost at the pump, um, those savings can then offset the increase on your on your bill for that piece that you're carrying. And it ends up being a really good um, month to month positive cash flow for a customer. That's um, that's great stuff, Tom. Thanks for that. Um, I want to talk about so you know we're we're looking at the incentives. We've talked to that a little bit. We are getting some questions coming up here in the chat, and one question that you know I I just have no concept of what the answer here might be. So I want to direct this maybe to Ben, maybe to Julian. Uh, is there a common communications protocol for all types of charging stations in order to communicate with the grid for the issues you mentioned? Now, that's really important, right? Because as a consumer, I don't know any of that kind of communication. I don't, you know, does it matter if I'm buying a specific charger that it's going to be able to figure all that stuff out through my utility? Uh, or, you know, is it just the ones from Flow you can use everywhere, right? So, um, Julian, Ben, maybe that's something you guys can speak to. Sure. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start uh, really quickly. So, uh, basically, with the network charging stations, uh, how they communicate uh, with our backends or with any backends, uh, it really differ uh, from one model to another. Uh, us, for example, we are leveraging power line communication. So it's basically a plug and play approach where you would use the electrical infrastructure uh, to communicate with the charging station. So you will just have a module to plug next to your router at home. Uh, and that allows quite a, a flexible approach for the install. Uh, others might leverage Wi-Fi's or other communication protocols. Uh, but when it comes to the one step closer to the utilities, right? How do they gather those data? How do they speak to those charging station? Uh, it will really depend on the utility itself and how they've approached their demand response project. Um, there are actually other stakeholders involved in, in most cases, which we refer to as distributed energy resource management softwares, so DERMS for short, uh, that would act as an aggregator or as, as a third party to kind of uh, catch all of those charging stations in our era and communicate with them um, through commands. Uh, and those commands actually have different uh, protocol that are either uh, open communication protocols or APIs. So it, it really depends as well on the DERMS that is selected for demand response projects. So I know it's, there's no easy answer. I, I guess I, I cannot really uh, overly simplify that. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you, if you have more to say. Um, I, I think maybe one But last I think note. to answer, to kind of address the question, because there's the question that's asked and then there's the, the question that's really being asked. So I think the question that's really being asked is, is this something that I as a consumer need to worry about or is this something that my charging, the charger, the home charger that I purchased, that's on their end. That if I buy a home charger that has this smart feature capability built in, I can have confidence that it's gonna work regardless of where I am. Like if I'm buying it on a, from an online retailer or buying it through a website direct from the manufacturer, it's not going to get to me and it's going to say, oh, you're in Iowa. We only built this thing for California and New York. Correct. So on the consumer side, there's not so much to, to think about. Uh, I would say, though, that utilities have pre-approved charging stations for a certain uh, program. So it would just make sure that uh, your type of charging station would be approved for these particular programs. Uh, it's not always the case, but uh, I guess that's the only uh, real points to consider. Uh, on the customer side, you won't see any difference on how he install it or how he uh, acts uh, with it or how he, he charges his vehicles or just uh, in case of demand response events. Uh, but that, that would be really about it. Okay, now I, I'll, I'll direct that back to Tom. So Tom, you, you guys are with QMerit. For those of you listening who are not totally familiar with QMerit, you work with a lot of the OEMs, a lot of the car dealers to, to do those. Um, you know, home installations. And, and we've talked about this, that one of the biggest disconnects is the utilities are very verbal about this. The charging station manufacturers are very vocal about, you know, answering questions and consumer questions. You guys at QMerit do a great job with your FAQs, answering people's questions and getting them installed. But even you said, you know, one of the people that you should ask is the dealerships. Often that's kind of the biggest disconnect, right? That's the last place that you're going to get you know, maybe a straight answer, either they don't know, they're trying to skip past that, they don't want to squirrel the deal by, you know, giving you a high, a high number, you know, can you speak to some of that and some of those resources that consumers might say like, oh, my dealer told, told me this and you can say, listen, buddy, I'm going to send you to this other website 
they're going to give you the uh, the straight story? Yeah, it's a good question. And so in most cases, Joe, we find it's a it's just we don't know, right? You know, a dealership is looking to sell a vehicle and they may not have all of the information. We know that the utilities are really interested in connecting better with the dealership because that is the point of purchase. And Cumerit's taking great effort into helping that connection take place so that at the point of purchasing that vehicle through the dealership, you do have some good information as to what those incentives might be. Um, the OEM sites are critical. So in most cases, um, you can both connect to the dealer or you can schedule an install with Cumerit, for instance, through those vehicle manufacturer sites as well. And there are a lot of tools that are be putting in place because dealers are looking at accelerating the sales of these as well. And so they'd like to be able to connect um, those. I think it really is just getting the information out there and making sure that those dealerships have that. Um, we always recommend that folks that are purchasing these be as informed. Don't rely on that dealership to provide you that information. Again, the utility has great information on that site. Cumerit has great information on our site. If you schedule an install directly through the Cumerit site, we can provide the feedback on utility incentives that are available, um, tax credits, all of that information. That and might your provide. guys, based on where the consumer is, based on where the customer is, they're buying the the charging station, the chart, the wall charger, all of that directly through you guys, and it's already vetted with the utility company in that area, correct? And it's very specific in terms of the areas. In some cases, the the manufacturers, the car manufacturers, are providing the chargers, Joe, and we install for them. In other cases, the consumer is asking for those, and and we would be connecting them with chargers that are eligible. Um, for those incentives. The utilities have marketplaces now. And so in some cases, you can go online to your utility and purchase a charger and receive the incentive directly through those. And so you do have options um, at the way you look to procure. Again, just as uh, my, sound like a broken record, but at, my advice is to be as informed as you can. Cumerit's a good resource for that. I know Flow provides great information on their sites as to what these incentives will be. Obviously, the Rocky Mountain Institute has great information, even on a much broader sense, as customers are looking to get informed, not only on EV vehicles, but on electrification as a whole, and the impact that they could provide to them as a consumer. Yeah. So I, I think these are all great answers. So, you know, I, I don't want to kind of keep going about some stuff that we've already talked about when it comes to home charging. There is some more questions that we want to get to, but I do want to move on. Once we've gotten that 80% of all charging occurs at the home, we do need to address that 20% that happens elsewhere, right? And some of the recent things that I've been reading about, you know, there's been studies that show that something like 20 to 25% of charging stations in some areas that are publicly available are down, they're not working, you know, they, they're maintenance on that is very network dependent. Sometimes the location owns it. Sometimes the network maintains it. Now, Julian, when, when we talk to you at Flow, you guys manufacture those wall chargers for people to put in the home, but you're also doing commercial level chargers. Can you speak to some of that and some of those things as far as, you know, what goes into maintaining them and why there's so, seems to be so much non-maintenance happening out there? Yes, definitely, and, and that's a great point. Um, as you just mentioned, so we at Flow provide some uh, residential charting solution, but we also have solution for kind of every market segment, so public locations, commercial location, and whatnot. Um, and really for the, the new EV drivers or, or people that are considering uh, buying an EV, I think there's a, some of shift of paradigm uh, to kind of consider uh, compared to, uh, let's say, the internal combustion engine. So your regular cars, right, you would go once every week, once every two weeks to your gas station when the, the tank is empty and you would just refuel it in a couple of minutes. Um, so this is a past experience. I think right now uh, with the EVs, what you have to consider is rather that um, every time you're going to park somewhere at the groceries, at the restaurant, at your home, or even where you work, uh, you will eventually get to have an opportunity to top off the battery. Um, so really for those drivers that have uh, the chance to have residential charging, uh, they will also have the opportunity to charge elsewhere. And even for those who may not be able to deploy it right away, uh, a charging station at their home, uh, they will probably find other public charging stations around them. 
Um, and basically, uh, I, I guess you, you, you talked about a great point of, around reliability. I think uh, in the last few years, we, we talked a lot about um, range anxiety and how it might have affected some upcoming EV driver. And I think the industry as a whole made uh, great efforts and uh, great progress uh, towards uh, reducing this range anxiety. Uh, but as you just described from a user experience, from a driver's, there's, I think, nothing worse than driving a few kilometers out of your way or trying to find a charging station that is, in the end, um, not working. Um, so really, I think the industry is now moving towards the reliability and consideration. And um, at Flow, it's really about how we design our charging stations. So uh, everything from the casing that we select, the aluminum products, uh, and just the type of enclosure, uh, so type 4X, for example, which is weatherproof, waterproof. So um, everything we try to select for the product from the cables to the, the casing is just made to, to last. Um, I would really just want to uh, produce those charging stations to deploy them uh, to be used again and again across uh, uh, multiple years. So uh, that's really what we're trying to, to, to target at Flow, and, and I'm sure the EV industry is moving towards this direction as well. So uh, there's two points that I want to bring up, and then I, I have a question for Ben that's related to this. So the first thing is that, you know, we've gotten to the point now with some of these EVs, whether we're talking about the Porsche Taycan or the ID4, that they can charge very, very quickly. And taking it from a very near zero 10% charge to an 80% charge and putting 200 miles into the vehicle really does only take 15 to 20 minutes in some circumstances. So that model of, hey, I live in an apartment and I get gas once a week or every two weeks, you can still do that. If you're familiar with where those high-powered chargers are, you can very easily go to Target or go to Whole Foods, plug into a high-speed charger, and for you know, 8 or 10 or $15 while you're doing your other shopping where you have that dwell time, fill up your vehicle with you know, electrons or electric juice or whatever that uh, electric fuel stuff is made out of, right? Um, the question that I wanted to ask, you know, we're talking about this reliability. We're talking about, great, Flow is making these corrosion resistant chargers that are low maintenance and some other manufacturers I'm sure are, are trying to catch up to what you guys are doing as well. But this is a question for Ben. And, and I think that Ben, maybe you have more insight on this than the rest of us do because of your role in kind of a research phase. We have this new, you know, NEVI law, the new bipartisan infrastructure law coming out. We're talking about $5 billion being spent on setting up chargers every 50 miles. You know, what does that really look like? And, you know, how can, how can we kind of ensure as people who are, as taxpayers ultimately funding this, how can we make sure that what's going in in place there is going to be something that's going to last and going to be reliable? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Maybe just, just briefly to go back to the previous discussion, because I want to make a, a point here. Uh, we often throw around this number that about 80% of charging currently takes place at home. Uh, and I think Tom mentioned this earlier. That's great. And we want to do as much of that as we can, because people can charge overnight, relatively low cost, relatively low emissions. We want to do as much of that as we can. But I think it's also important to recognize two things. One, many and I would say the majority of EV owners today live in single family homes where that's a lot easier than it is for people who live, for example, in multi-unit dwellings. So just a, as a, let's call ourselves an EV community, right? We need to be aware of the fact that that's not representative of the whole population. And so we need to be thinking more and more about how we can provide sort of equitable access to EV charging for, for everyone. Over time, I think that percentage of home charging will decrease in part because we'll have a broader sort of tent of people who are driving EVs, not all of whom have easy access. Now that, that relates to this other discussion around these you know, charging outside of the home, whether you go to the grocery store or to the department store, or you, know, you need to uh, sort of top off things at a DC fast charging station. That's all gonna, I, I see it as, you, know, you don't wanna only have one location where you can charge, you wanna have a lot of options. Most of that, if you can do it at home overnight, wonderful, but we're gonna all need a, a broader system. And so we, we definitely want to support putting in place a, a pretty broad network of chargers that uh, can fill up everyone's cars as they need it. Now, to segue into your, your actual question, Joe, and thanks for humoring me there. Uh, so NEVI is the, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. This is a, a, 
program that the Biden administration is putting forth that came out of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was signed into law last November. Uh, so you, I think people are at least generally familiar with this multi-billion or actually I should say trillion dollar um, larger package. Within that, there are seven and a half billion dollars dedicated to EV charging infrastructure. And of that, the lion's share, so five billion out of the seven and a half billion goes specifically to all of the states um, plus DC and Puerto Rico um, to put in place specifically DC fast charging stations, as Joe mentioned, every 50 miles along what we call alternative fuel corridors or more specifically electric alternative fuel corridors. That's a lot of kind of jargon and perhaps a little bit confusing, but I think that the way to think about this program, which is uh, getting a lot of attention from state departments of transportation right now, is that each state is getting a big chunk of change. So I think Texas gets the most um, followed by California. And there's a formula that I won't go into as to which states get what, it's not just population. Um, and that specifically is going to really develop a critical backbone of fast charging stations along the nation's interstate highways. And so if you think back to, uh, I believe it was the Eisenhower administration in the 50s putting in place the, the interstate highway uh, system in general, that was this huge public effort to sort of build out a network that we're going to use. This is a smaller version of that um, along those interstates that's focused on really providing confidence for consumers that they can go on a road trip and they can fill up their cars. Uh, so I, maybe I'll stop I, there. I, wanna, I don't want to take too much airtime, but no, no, I, that's what this I, program's I, about. Yeah, there's something I want to mention here because you mentioned that confidence, the confidence in your fuel, right? When you're driving down the highway in an internal combustion car, every couple of miles you see a hundred foot tall lit up sign that says Shell or Chevron, and it's got the pricing there and it lights up at night. You know, an EV charger, even the Tesla superchargers that are the most visible, right? They're like six or eight feet tall. And if you're going 70 miles an hour blasting past them on the highway, you don't see them, right? So I think that visibility is a huge thing. What's being done or, or, or what do you think should be done from the point of view of getting people to be aware that electric fuel is available in these locations? Is it a sign on the highway? Is it a, you know, 100 foot neon sign that says electrify America or charge point or whatever it might be? Yeah, well, sort of the, the cut and dried version of that is within the requirements from this federal program, there has to be, you know, so-called EV signage. But I don't think that that's the eye-popping, you know, neon lights that you're talking about. That's the, the road sign next to the thing that, you know, looks like a rest area sign, essentially, with an EV charger. So that minimal amount is included and, and is a requirement. Um, but yeah, I think that as, you know, this is going to be developed in most states, uh, if not all states, by private firms that are getting this funding from the federal government through the state DOTs, uh, Departments of Transportation, that is. And so they will have some latitude in terms of how they go about their marketing and their awareness and so forth. So I would fully expect to see that there are more of these uh, kind of gas station type uh, messaging and, and um, signage that would attract people to it, which to your point, probably will help in terms of people understanding, oh, I'm starting to see more of this. If I was to buy an EV, I could go there. I could go over there, you know? So I think that will help. Yeah, I think, I think uh, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I totally, I can't wait to see, you know, um, there was a recent study by BP. They were forced in the UK to put electric charging stations at their gas stations uh, or, or I'm sorry, petrol stations, right? Cause it's the UK. Um, and then they actually found that the, each individual charging station was actually more profitable than their fuel pumps because they had a longer dwell time. People were staying, buying things at the store, making use of the other services there. And so they've actually accelerated it beyond what was required. And I'm, I'm waiting to see that here in the States where we have the huge signs and the big buildings and everything else. So um, that's going to be very exciting. Joe, real quick, one of the things I mentioned, most of our drivers like to view their vehicles a little bit more like the smartphone, right? In that application. And so, um, they're available right now to consumers, either through the manufacturer, the charger, or third parties. Most will use apps and make sure that they have available, see what's available. Companies like Chargeway are educating consumers on utilization of energy as a fuel, electricity as a fuel. And so it, we would say in most cases, I'm hoping we don't see 150 foot giant signs up along <laughs> the, the highways that, uh, that do, but I think 
it, 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 most of these consumers are using that education. Yeah. It would become well, and that's a really good point. You know, you mentioned Chargeway. Chargeway is a, a good friend of Clean Technica as well. Uh, we d didn't plan on plugging them too much, but you know, Chargeway, a better route planner. Even if you have the in-network apps like from Electrify America, they do a really great job of showing you as you're driving where these charging stations are, and not only that, but also helping you plan that that trip, right? So, you know, you might go into one of these apps and plan that trip and they'll tell you the, the shortest times to stop here and here and go. And using those route planners like, you know, uh, ABP and Chargeway, it really does help in terms of confidence. Um, I, I don't want to wrap up, but I know we're coming to the end of our time contract here and everybody's, you know, got busy stuff, including the, the people who are attending this webinar. So first of all, thank you for everybody who's been paying attention to us. Thank you, Tom, Julie, and Ben. This has been great stuff. I do want to get to some of the questions that are in here and there, there's a few that I think are, are really good. You know, um, I want to speak to this one here. Uh, it's uh, there are different battery developments to increase the EVs range. Uh, solid materials, liquid and Leon batteries or lime metal batteries. Should EV customer or EV charger customers replace their units with new ones? I, I can't speak to stuff that happens in the future because like I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not Karnak the Magnificent for those of you who are old enough to know who Johnny Carson is. Um, that's not too many people anymore. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that anybody who's developing this, that electricity that's coming out of your wall, that 120 or 220, that is going to be the variable that's already been solved for. And I want to say that anybody who's developing a new advanced battery technology is doing so with the understanding that it's going to have to be compatible with 110 or 220 because trying to develop something for, for something that just doesn't exist, it's not something that we use in you know, the developed Western world, I think is going to be a, a hard sell. But I, you know, obviously we've got Julian here, we've got Ben here. They're the, uh, the engineers and they've got their finger on the pulse of what's actually happening out there. I mean, do you guys think that's something we need to be concerned about? Are we all going to Osborne ourselves uh, to use the, the Osborne 2 business analogy? Or are we all going to just wait until there's an instant charging, you know, solid state cordless system or is that something that it doesn't really make a ton of sense to be concerned about at this point? I would just say briefly, uh, I don't think, I think that things are changing quickly, but they're not changing that quickly. And so if you have a current EV that's working for you, I don't think you're going to get, you know, leapfrogged overnight by the newest technology. Uh, if you find that there's some features of newer models, whether that's of EVs or of chargers that aren't available to you today, in a couple of years, there's always the option of selling your current EV and buying the newest one. There's a very strong used market today, both for EVs and for conventional vehicles. Um, I don't think that's going to change too much in the next couple of years. So I would probably say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it um, and maybe leave it at that. Yeah, I, yes, I um, on my end, I don't have much more oh, to, to add, ahead, sorry. No, no, I was, I was uh, thinking you were about to throw me the question again, so I, was, I, I don't have much more to add than what just been described. <laughs> no, no, I, I love that I got interrupted to be told that there's nothing to interrupt me for. <laughs> this Perfect. is the best webinar so far. All right, so um, there's a question here. Do you have a special directive in the U.S. for electrical engineers who install charging stations issued by regulatory or standardization organizations? I want to say yes, that you just can't, willy-nilly start splicing into electrical cables, but I mean, like, I've electrocuted myself before. I, I think Tom is probably the best person to answer this. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously it starts with, and we always say, you know, the safety and, and compliance of your electrical contractor, right? So you have to ensure that they are properly licensed and insured um, C10 electrical contractors to be able to do the work, right? And so that, that always stands out. As we see funding come in through the states, the utilities or the federal government, there are different certifications that are being introduced um, as part of that. An example might be an EVITP certification for installations. So nothing, Joe, that has been set across that says mandated across um, all functions to be able to do that, to say no um, electrician that isn't a certain standard certification can't do that work. Um, we would always default to the, the C10 license and the proper insurance, and then the funding sources will drive what other certifications, whether it's utility incentive program, those type of things. 
Now, when you say we, you mean Q Merit. So if I go through a Q Merit or if I go through the OEM, I can have confidence that I'm getting someone who's licensed, insured, kind of knows what they're doing kind of thing. Is that what we're getting yeah, at? Yeah, I think that's always the biggest concern is ensure that it's proper license, um, that that electrician isn't a handyman um, that, that can do that work or raises her hand and say, sure, I can do that work, right? Um, and ensuring, in many cases, we see our our OEM customers or partners that feel like they have electricians, but but they, nobody checks those licenses, no one checks the insurance, those type of thing. It's because this is electrical work, and you mentioned the issue of safety previously. These are safe technologies, but they do require proper installation. Um, and so, Cumerit, that's why so many of the OEMs do contract with us to do their residential installations is that they're assured that we are providing a contractor base that is licensed, insured, um, background checks, all of the things that you would want as you're letting uh, an individual or a contractor into your home. All right, and then this one, I don't even know where to go to answer this question, so I'm gonna pitch it to Ben, because Ben seems smart. Uh, the federal tax credit for installing EV charging systems recently expired at the end of 2021. Is it on the table for a retroactive renewal this year? Yeah, great question. I do not know the answer to that. I haven't heard anything to that effect, but I have not been looking that closely into that particular program. So apologies, but uh, I can't really it help It just on seems... That. Yeah, no, it seems like there's not, a, an, and I, I'll, I'll speak to it at least this much, it doesn't seem like there's an appetite either from the current administration or the current Congress, and, and that's either House of Congress, to continue rolling out tax incentives and rebates on EVs. If you look at what's been happening, obviously Tesla and GM have both burned through their $7,500 tax credits. Uh, this last quarter was Toyota's last quarter to qualify for the full tax credit. And there doesn't seem to be a big appetite to extend that or to grandfather in like, you know, the 250,000th guy to buy a Tesla, right? So I, I, I'm going to say no. I mean, I'll look into the crystal ball and say no. And um, sure. if, I, if I turn out to be wrong, I'll edit that out. Yeah, Joe, most of the activity we've seen in the discussions on extending the tax credits have been towards driving lower price points. Yes. Um, and so uh, we do see some activity in that and, and there's great progress made you know, through the relationships we have with the OEMs. We know that in the next couple of years, there'll be 150 plus new models that are coming out of EV vehicles. And, and that's, and only, that's only in the brands that are currently selling in the US. That's correct. not including the Chinese that are gonna start bringing over another 150. Correct, and, and I, those price points are coming down significantly and so um, we don't have time to explore it too much, but as Ben mentioned, this is going to open up for substantial, um, a, a big population of drivers. And as we know, in states like California, we're close to 50% of the residents in California live in multifamily. Um, that creates potential challenges. I can just assure the potential uh, drivers out there that the OEMs are aggressively looking at ways to work with companies like Cumerit, with work with companies like Flow, to find strategies for their potential buyers that do live in those multifamily uh, to ensure that they do have adequate charging available at their residence. Well, maybe just one more point here, Joe, yeah. to, to specifically to the question given it's around EVSE, uh, the, the, the chargers themselves. I would say, you know, this is very case dependent, but definitely if you have not already, check in, check out your, uh, your local utilities webpage and any state level programs, because I, I think that often people are not fully aware of everything that's out there. Recognizing you who, who asked the question, whoever that was, um, may, may already have done this, but if you haven't, I would certainly encourage you to take a look there. Yeah, 100%. Um, I really like this question. I know we're going out of order here, but uh, we're, we're basing this on questions I like best. So sorry, guys. Uh, there is a jerry can in most of today's vehicles in case a vehicle goes out of gas. Uh, well, I mean, I think most of today's vehicles is probably a stretch. I haven't had a jerry can in one of my internal combustion cars in about 20 years, but uh, fair enough. You probably have one of yours. What will replace that in EVs? Now, so there's a couple of companies now, there's one in specific that is, or in particular that is working with Hyundai and Kia. Uh, they have a product called the Roadie, where if you call your roadside assistance that you're out of juice, they're going to bring this essentially a lithium ion battery pack that'll plug into your car and give you five or 10 miles of juice to get to the next charger. Now that said, 
there does seem to be a, a recent set of patents from General Motors as well as Ford to show that you can charge your electric vehicle from another electric vehicle. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen that in practice yet too much, but um, maybe one of my fellow panelists can speak to that vehicle to vehicle charging a little bit more. Um, Lots well, of confused faces, guys. <laughs> yeah, I guess Not so. filling me with confidence. <laughs> I think really the analogy that it would be closest to a jerry can to me would just be level one charting, just having this card in the trunk and what we would refer to as a trickle charting, right? Um, I think finding a typical outlets would be, uh, in most cases, uh, something you could do uh, when you're in that type of situation. Uh, but to your point about vehicle to vehicle charting, uh, I, I cannot comment. I, I do not know uh, of where it might go. So yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes when we do the uh, when we do the the YouTube yeah, the version. Lion, I'll put it there. Joe, the lion's share of the vehicles now are are receive a charge, and so what we will see. We've talked a lot about technology and technology advancement, but most of the OEMs are committing to bi-directional charging in the next several years, and so that will allow a larger vehicle to send a charge into a smaller vehicle or into the home or even back to the grid. So back to creating opportunities for that. It's, it's easy to imagine your AAA tow truck driving around with a small charger in those circumstances, just like they do with a gas can as it comes through. But I think we are, we're seeing chargers as well as vehicles starting towards that direction, bi-directional. I think we're going to continue to see that pretty aggressively. I, I want to highlight something that Julian said, because it's a very smart thing, and it's not something that we talk about too much in the realm of charging. And that's this. If you have your charging cable in your trunk and it's a 110 outlet, anywhere that has electricity, you can plug in and get juice. It might be slow, it might not be as fast as you want, but if you see a light bulb, chances are that's a place that you can plug in and charge your vehicle. So I, I think that, you know, this idea that you must be at a public charger in order to charge your car, I think is one that is not, um, I would say, not totally accurate. Anywhere that you have electricity, you have a means of, uh, of charging an EV. Uh, the last thing I want to address here before we cut out and run out of time. Time. I think that we got about two, three minutes left. This one will do it. Can we address multifamily residential and commercial fleets by combining rooftop solar and PV canopies? And I, I don't really know how to answer that question. I wonder, uh, Julian or Tom, do you have any experience with putting your charging stations or putting in any charging stations in a multifamily or commercial place that's got that solar canopy and, and how that feeds into it? Uh, Julian, feel free. I know Joe real quickly. We do have, and we have partners that we work with that combine storage and solar with charge, right? And the idea is just, again, most of it is on load management and, and making sure that these chargers aren't functioning at times where there might be higher cost electricity or grid constraints along those. Storage is a logical component. Um, to go along with charging as we go through. And, and storage is also a logical component with solar. And so we see many residential storage systems as well combined with solar that, that can work in conjunction with their charging. So it's a logical, and we are seeing particularly in apartment complexes and multifamilies, more solar canopy um, and storage integrated with charging. I, I would just add, if I, oh, Julian, sorry. No, go for it. Yeah, I would just add, it is, a, it is a great solution. It needs to be part of our solution set. The big challenge to my mind is that um, we need to do that for new buildings up front. We need to do the EV wiring. We need to get sufficient electrical capacity. We need to think about if we want to have solar and storage and any other distributed energy resources there to be part of this. Um, it's a lot harder for existing buildings, these retrofits. And so it's not to say that we shouldn't do that. We, we certainly should, but you know, as you see new developments in your communities, these are good questions to be asking. Hey, okay, maybe only two people in that apartment, in that 90 unit apartment complex have EVs today, but in five years, maybe 50 of them will. So let's think ahead a little bit here and let's get this in place. Uh, whether or not that includes something like solar to, to power the EV charging, all of this, we need to really front load it as much as we can and, and think several steps down the road. 
but that's a business case also to be made from the developers. Like even if it's not mandated, if you're developing a new property, you want to appeal to the broadest base of consumers possible. And you want people who are buying a new condo or buying a new home to feel confident that they'll be able to park their vehicle there, not just today, but in five, 10 and 15 years. So I think that speaks a little bit what Ben is saying that it is critical to have this stuff built into those, you know, built into those new developments and new buildings. Um, I, I think that's all the time that we actually have scheduled here. Uh, we're going to have, you know, uh, I'm sure a number of emails come through. I put my email address in the chat is Joe Boris, J O Boris at uh, cleantechnica.com. We'll have some other ways for you to reach out to Q Merit on their contact page and flow and RMI as well. Obviously thanks for, uh, you know, bringing us all together here for this webinar, Julian. Uh, this was, you know, obviously sponsored by Flow. Um, so I just kind of want to wrap it up there. And then if there's anything else that we want to say in closing, Julian, I'll kick it off to you. Uh, well, uh, great. Uh, thanks, Joe, for this uh, closing remarks. And thanks to uh, you for all those questions throughout the webinar. Um, really appreciate the discussion we had with RMI and uh, QMerit as well. So again, I think there will be uh, probably some communication upcoming with the links of the recording, maybe articles or just uh, even the uh, email address to reach out to any of us. So uh, again, it's been a pleasure and uh, really thanks for uh, managing this and uh, <laughs> throughout the webinar, yes. <laughs> yeah, you guys were great. All right, I'm going to uh, sign off here. Andy, I think we can, we can call it and we will have this in our Clean Technica YouTube and uh, we'll make that available as well as show notes with links to everybody's contact information. And that's about it. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.